So welcome everyone to this uh, 11th uh, Agile Beam uh, Meetups. Uh, tonight uh, we will have uh, Felipe, who will talk about uh, Scrum in construction. So after uh, having some people from uh, England, Spain, Brazil, we have tonight uh, Felipe from uh, California, US. So uh, hello, Felipe. Hello, Francois. Hello, Sebastian. Je so Philippe. Philippe. Bonsoir. <laughs> hello, hello. Uh, so Felipe is a well-known uh, YouTuber uh, for construction, uh, probably more than us. But uh, we are very happy to have him uh, tonight and to uh, to open more uh, our Agile Beam community. So we will have a small presentation uh, of Sebastian of the Agile Beam community and uh, our sponsor uh, Bricks. And after, Felipe will present uh, his, uh, his view uh, about uh, Scrum in construction. Uh, and uh, you can uh, ask some questions in the comments, and I will uh, ask him uh, this question and uh, interrupt him if, uh, if he don't mind. Okay, so Sebastian, it's your turn. Yes, hello all. Uh, so, as always, I will uh, present a bit why uh, we created the Agile Beam uh, community. So, it's uh, basically we, we, we are working on a platform, uh, Agile platform for architecture and construction. Uh, the name is Bricks, uh, BricksApp.io. And uh, to, to develop this platform, we needed to interview uh, many people to know. Uh, uh, but what represents for them Agile? Uh, do they know, know Agile? Do, uh, do they practice it and so on? And uh, the more we talk with people, the more we, uh, we find uh, already uh, people that know about Agile in uh, ar architecture and construction. And at the beginning, we, we just think, uh, okay, it's just for IT, but uh, not, it's not the case. And it's, uh, by the way, it's growing uh, more, more and more popular. The more we, we are doing the Agile meetup, the more we we meet people that, that know about it. And we found uh, it, it was a good thing to, to put this, all these people together and to popularize the, this, uh, this way of working. So we, we decided to create um, a community and to, um, to promote it. So what is agilebeam.org? Basically, it's a website. First, uh, you can access the, at this link, agilebeam.org. Uh, we are uh, organizing some meetups. So here you are at uh, one of these meetups every month. Basically, we have like uh, 11 meetups. So it's the 11th uh, meetup of this series. And uh, we try also to, uh, to centralize some information about how to practi practice Agile. So on the site, you could see, uh, for example, here, some uh, some uh, general explanation of why it's good to uh, why it's better to uh, to work uh, in, in the agile way uh, we try also to um, uh, to define what is the agile team etc so this is a wiki so you can contribute to this wiki uh, you can uh, by joining the community so uh, or you can join the community basically we have a slack channel so you can uh, you you can join uh, this Slack. We have a, um, a LinkedIn channel. Uh, we have uh, uh, this meetup uh, on LinkedIn, and uh, and also if you have a, if you are an agile coach or someone uh, uh, that that is in, who is interested in agile and want to be an agile coach specialized in the construction, you can uh, you can also uh, fill a form here. We we try to. Um, to put all the all um, this kind of profile together to uh, to see how we can promote it uh, to uh, possible clients. So this is Agile Beam. Uh, feel free to to share about it. And uh, now I will present you about Bricks. So what is Bricks? Uh, basically, so Bricks is our sponsor tonight. Also. <laughs> So here's a view of the screen. So I, I will just go back to um, to uh, the basic homepage. Basically, it's a tool uh, to to manage your your task, your project, uh, for uh, specialized uh, in construction. So, for example, we have a B model uh, viewer um, that allow to see the model and so on. Uh, sorry, where's where's my model? <laughs> I, I will go back to to this screen later. Ah, yes, it's here. It was a bit long to. So, 
Okay, so we have a BIM model support and we have uh, we have a board uh, to manage the task in an agile way. So here you can see your model. It's a EFC viewer. Um, and this is the uh, this is the difference uh, we have with uh, with for example uh, Trio. Uh, so what uh, Bricks allow to do basically it allow to um, to to list the tasks that need to be done and to work with this task in an agile way. Uh, for example, uh, using the Scrum uh, the Scrum framework. Uh, so Scrum is uh, probably you know about it, but the, the idea of Scrum is working uh, in short iteration uh, and here you can uh, follow this iteration, so you can uh, answer to the questions that uh, many people ask in uh, architecture project. Uh, so, what, what uh, the, this topic? What, what's going on with this topic? Where, where it is on? Uh, what happened with this topic? So, well, when you exchange uh, with email, by phone call, with uh, meeting and report, so on, you, you are a bit lost on what needs to be done. And we, with uh, visual management like this, uh, with uh, Kanban board, it's more easy. Uh, we also have uh, the possibility to um, to define some sprint and some uh, stage. So what is a sprint? Basically, it's a short iteration. So Felipe will talk uh, much more uh, in detail about this. Uh, but it, basically, it's a law to, um, to define what is important for the client and to prioritize uh, better. So I, I will not go far in uh, in detail about Briggs because we can have uh, we have some special uh, webinar and podcast uh, about Briggs. If you are interested, you can uh, join this webinar or contact us. Uh, just I will uh, I will give the, the speech to Felipe uh, so he talk us about uh, his practice in Agile in the US. Thank you. So Thank you, Sebastian. So, uh, Felipe, I, I will just uh, introduce you a little bit. So, you are a, a sales entrepreneur and an international lean speaker, and uh, you are actually uh, implemented uh, agile practices in a in a big uh, contractor in the uh, US. That is so, correct. We oui. all all true. Your turn. Your turn. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Uh, Thank you, Bricks, for putting on the Agile BIM meetup today. Number 11, lucky prime number for me. I love that. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, watching the live stream, please feel free to drop your comments and questions in. Francois is so graciously going to bring your questions forward to me as we go. So I just want to show my screen. This entire presentation I'm about to show you was built in Trello first, designed in Trello using Scrum. And I also have a board in mural if as we can see here you can keep me on screen at all times sebastian i am not screen shy so sebastian shared with us the presentation of agile bricks i'm gonna move that to done for you sebastian getting all the benefits the serotonin is pumping through my blood already I'm excited that we're getting things done and then francois and sebastian switched up on me sebastian actually took care of also showing bricks so we'll just change that to Sebastian, without the, the, the punctuation. See, we can change things in real time. If we don't adapt ourselves, are we really doing Agile? No, we're not. We have to always be adapting. See how easy that was? It was effortlessly easy for me to make that change. What I'm going to do now is just show you my thinking, and then we're going to get right into it. We started with the call to action on LinkedIn, and we promised to deliver this. So we took the section description. And then from there, we created three stories that I want to share. A simple Kanban story. And this is, a sim this is a real Kanban board example from a construction team. We'll go into more detail there. We have a design scrum story. And we have a construction story to share. A couple of stories, actually. And in between each one of these, we're going to have some Q&A, where I will pause for questions to make sure you're still with me. Everything is organized here in this board at the end of the presentation i'm going to drop some links into the youtube comments so the people watching this live can click for more information on how to contact me as well as some additional online resources as promised you will have those soon and check those out on the replay and people on the replay if you're watching this later ask questions connect with me on linkedin and feel free to direct message me so first thing is we've got a simple scrum board here and the goal, Scrum and Agile, the very best in class practice, has to start with the end in mind. 
Our goal is to make your work, all of you, exponentially easier and more valuable for your teams, yourself included. I want to help everyone be able to definitively decide when should I use simple Kanban? When should I morph to Scrum with confidence so that you know that you'll be experimenting towards value immediately? And then I want you all to see one piece flow throughout the whole thing so you can see how to double your productivity with less effort visually, as Sebastian alluded to. And then we want to get your questions answered. It's very important to me to answer all your questions. So that is our goal for the session. This is Mural that I'm using here. It's an online whiteboard space. There are many other platforms like Miro. This is Mural, M-U-R-A-L. And the first thing we're going to do is we're going to come in and see about Kanban. You can see right now we're doing it. Let's check back in our master scrum board here in Trello. And yes, in fact, we have Kanban here as well. So that's there. This is what we're going to do first. So what is Kanban? For those of you that don't know, Kanban is a Japanese word that in English is most often translated to a visual board or a sign. That's it. In this team, Kanban is very lightweight. It was born in places like Toyota. They get a lot of credit for it. There have been a lot of published articles. You can learn more about Kanban on the web for free at Wikipedia or other software companies like Kanbanize have some resources online as well. I just took a picture just to show you that you can use your favorite searching browser. It doesn't have to be Google. You can use DuckDuckGo or whatever you like and search and find things I'm going to share with you. I'm going to share some nuggets though. You need to have a team or at least yourself. So in today's example, I have Felipe, we, I have me, myself, and I. So I have four, four people. Use your imaginations. I want to make it so that's easy to understand. Simply, when would you use Kanban over Scrum or a combination of both? Because Scrum does use Kanban, but in a very specific way. If your work is simple, that is a good candidate for Kanban. And I'll show you to the right in a second. Once your work starts to shift towards complicated, as, you in, as more people are on your team or on your project that you're working on designing construction, let's say when you get north of four people, you are now entering into the complicated to complex zone. And that is a great place to use Scrum instead. So if it's simple, repetitive tasks that are well-known, tying your shoes, as an example, something that you can do blindfolded is good for Kanban. As it's more complicated, it's different. So coming back out, these are real examples from this board. So I, sh I showed this board quickly. So here's the board, real construction project. It's organized as a Kanban board. I've digitized some of those tasks just to make it more clear. So you'll see here on this Kanban board, I've got a lines drawn. I've got columns that people are like, Felipe, it looks just like a Scrum board. Yes, because Scrum borrowed from Kanban and is using it inside of Scrum. But this is very, you'll see what the difference is in a second. We have work and place limits with these lines. We have four swim lanes, one for each person. And this particular team, I just so happen to be on top because um, I made the board. So that's why I put myself on top. <laughs> oh, myself, I'm sorry, is in row three. So be ready to answer. These are just examples. Being ready to answer. A key takeaway from this Kanban example is really for all of you in the audience. So I'm going to move that into doing. And each of these swim lanes represents a different person. Now I've created a gap. Once I finish this, even as this gap is created, you're just, everyone feels the pull. You feel the pull to this gap. That gap is saying, we need to fill something in. You feel it. So we move in the next card. While I'm working on this, the key takeaway. The key takeaway from Kanban, my opinion, having used it for a long, long time, over a decade, is that it limits work in progress. I can't do two things at once as I'm working, but I have a gap. As things move over, they're getting ready. You can see that my Kanban limit for my work in this example, if this was an, a 10-hour workday, which is very typical for us in the construction industry, I have three things on deck to accomplish in this 10-hour workday. 
In order for me to change that, we need to do some kind of experiment, a process change or a policy change. But right now, as designed, working as, say, a project engineer, all I can do is these three things as designed. Maybe I have in some room for things that come up on site, but that is not here in this workflow. And the second person, me, me can also work simultaneously and we'll fill in their gaps as they go and things click over. As different people work, now we have myself down here at the bottom also getting ready for another takeaway and the work is moving from left to right. It's very visual. You can tell that I hasn't started doing anything yet. Why is I not working? It's very visual. You can see maybe I is not here. Maybe I is not here today for whatever reason. And as the work gets done, let's say me finishes first, then me will pull in the next action to take and the next action moves over. And people are visually making their work seen to everyone on the team. It's clear in the snapshot right now that I is going to get a phone call from Felipe. What's going on, I? Do you need help? Or maybe I is on a second shift, right? So that's a possibility. What could happen is we can merge. Say we do an experiment and we change and we, we let I go do something else, switch them to another project. And now we've made it so that myself can do multiple things or to make it just more realistic, Felipe is going to do more things. Myself is going to just go up to lane one. Now Felipe has the capability to handle six things. I have six spots ready in this example where myself only has capacity for three at any given day. Me has also equal capacity, but Felipe has double the capacity because he's secretly using Scrum. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> and at the end of this uh, Kanban example, I'm showing that learning about Scrum is the end of every flow. I hear a lot of feedback from people that start out with Kanban. Eventually, when they move into that complex or more complicated work, they will start to pull in more pieces of the Scrum framework naturally into their practice as they need more framework and scaffolding to go through their work with larger teams or in getting into more complex work. So that's one example. I want to pause for a question. Francois, do we have any questions or comments from the audience? Uh, we have Eric that is 100% uh, 1,000% uh, agree with you, but I, I have me uh, personally um, a question, but uh, did, do, do you think that uh, Kanban is, is a good uh, uh, start to, to go uh, in uh, agile practices? So you, you are first to say, okay, uh, yes. my project is very complex, so I go directly to Scrum, or you, you think it's better to start with a small project with a uh, with Kanban, uh, practice a little bit Kanban, and after, uh, go to Scrum. I'll tell you what I see yeah. most often, and then I'll give you my opinion. So most often, I see people doing Kanban first. And then as they get comfortable with making the work visible, because that's what I showed you here with myself, you know, working, that we're processing an RFI, right? This, this step here is something extra on top of what people are already doing. Most teams, Francois, as you know, in design and construction, they just go straight to work. They just, they have meetings, they do some work, they, they go in the field, other people working. They don't have this visual system in place to limit work in progress. WIP is work in progress. Yes, when you, you, you when people flip to this, Francois, then they have the ability to start to see flow. And they also have the opportunity to get help from team members. Like if this RFI really ends up being something really problematic, we might signal signal to the team for help that we're, we need some help here. We might have to bring me and Felipe involved in this, in which case we will. So I think that's a great point, Francois. Start simple with Kanban first and just get into the habit of making your work visible. Toyota Production System, principle number seven. Use visual controls and visual management to guide your hand to, to get flow. It's all about creating flow. So I yes, think that's you, a great example. You don't talk a, a lot to the, yes, the benefits. So you... you you put some more details now, but it's yes, it's not uh, just a board to to know uh, to to know if people are working good or not. It's uh, yes, you you said that it's the um, uh, visual management system, and uh, you could have a lot of benefits uh, with that. Right, exactly. Like you could even see, like in the 
in the to-do list here on deck, some, some people might even simplify their Kanban and just say like, this is our daily Kanban. They might, you know, take this tag off the board and just, and lose this as well. Take that off the board and simplify their Kanban to just to do doing done. That's very common. This is a very common workflow. This is future work coming up to do work in progress, what I'm doing right now, and then work that I'm, that I've already accomplished. So those are, I mean, very easy to start with. The work in place limit is critical. And like I said, we didn't double the workload for Felipe just because, you know, he's got the purple circle here. We did it. We made a change and we increased his output, his capability due to maybe some training, some skills or something else, a, a change the team makes. But, and that's something that eventually the team, we can pull this down, right? And then maybe Felipe and me are going to work together all the time. There's very common in some some areas of the construction that people work in pairs quite often, especially yeah, with new people. What you say, if the, the team have to organize these combos the way they, they want to, to work and they, they try to... Uh, to, to work better and they can change the, the Kanban uh, to optimize uh, their work. Exactly. And then I just want to share a little bit of the story behind that uh, Kanban example. We, we have a, another, just a, oh, yeah. another Bring another short question. question. What does the colors mean? So the colors on this board are, are just different types of activities. I don't have a key. You definitely could add a key. I've got learning about Scrum in yellow. Just because I just hit copy paste, <laughs> so no other reason than that. But I've got uh, I do have different colors here. I've made green uh, submittal, so engineering work. I've made green. I've made the planning work and administration blue. And for extra credit, I could have added a key to signify that. I made things that had to do with the field, like things that are stopping progress in the field. I made them pink or yellow, or pink or light pink. And and that was it. So that was that was the the logic behind that. That was a great question. I just wanted to share. If there's any other questions, Francois, just interrupt me. the The team here that used that board that I showed, they were a talented construction team that that was newer. They'd heard about Scrum and they wanted to try this. There were some new hires on the team that were working in construction for less than five years. What they needed to do, they needed. They were engineers and construction managers. They were, you know, successful in school and they wanted to be successful on the job and learn quickly and scale up. So they were, they needed some challenge, but they also needed to gain skills and experience working on site. That takes time. And this type of framework using Kanban supported them. What they went and did was they created a simple Kanban board, which I showed you in Trello. I'll put it back on the screen in a second. And then they started experimenting with it. What they found was that some people were working extra hard for no reason and they started spreading the workload as you can see here like on the on mural you can see that we've got a lot of work happening with felipe it might be because felipe has special skills and if we can start pairing felipe with myself or me we can we can start to cross train and skill up level up other people which is exactly what this construction team did so they can build some more capacity and go learn. Their Kanban journey was underway. And then what, what they found was that over time, they were able to reduce their work hours, stay within that 10 hours a day, not have to work on weekends, actually take vacations without having to take their computers with them with no interruption to the project. One of the things that happens on construction projects, especially with experts, is that you'll have people with certain skills and responsibilities, and there's not an easy way to get those skills to transfer to somebody when you're out sick or you're on vacation, planned planned absences, or volunteering on other things. So using this simple Kanban method allowed them to identify who had skills in what area and see the responsibilities and also help each other when they were away, which was fantastic and new to them. So this is the the price they wanted to pay was learning. They had to make a small investment in learning and they spent just half an hour during lunch one day to get this set up uh, and then put it into practice and practice it daily. When they finished this after a while, um, the learning was not done 
And one of the project engineers raised his hand and said, I, I want to learn Scrum and see how can we elevate this yet another level. And so they, they went to change and they put their entire closeout process for this project through the Scrum framework. And I just want to give a quote to Heraclitus, who said, the only constant is change. That's right, Heraclitus. It was right when you said it in Rome so many years ago, and it's still true today. And I'm sure somebody said it before Heraclitus, but he gets the credit. So that's the, the Kanban example. I'm going to come back out unless there are any questions, Francois. Yeah, uh, when when you say that, uh, you you are one hundred percent sure that uh, everybody it's work for every team, everybody, and and you you will work better uh, with that. Kanban guarantee. Con, I guarantee that if you make your work visible, you will have improvement, guaranteed. Whatever your throughput is right now, when you make your work visible in, in a manner even as simple as this, your throughput will increase. You'll be able to see things that you could not see before. And when you see, it becomes more obvious what you should know to do next. So that's for simple Kanban. And just to show you that, since there are no other questions from the audience, we're done with Kanban, let's move it over to done. So let's check our goal. Do we uh, now? No, there is another question. Oh, we have a question. That's excellent. Let's bring the question forward. Okay, we've got uh, yeah, Stephanie. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Hey, Stephanie, great to see you here on the live stream. How is it being monitored in real time <laughs> versus the doers? So the how field? is this bot being monitored? Yes. Yeah, that's a perfect. Uh, I'm sorry, Francois. I'm just too excited getting a question from a friend here. So the board, if the team is co-located, so no if the problem. team is all together, that means they're all together, then they can see the board in the office, in eyesight, in, in line of sight. They can see it and they can they adjust it and update it as they go. People outside of the team in the field, like Stephanie's alluding to, that to them who are putting work in place, it doesn't matter what's going on in the office and vice versa. We have I've seen some teams create these types of boards with trades, specifically electrical trades and HVAC mechanical ductwork piping trades, use simple Kanban boards at their toolbox or their job box in the field to organize the productivity planned work for the day and people in the office don't see that. It's these boards serve the people on the team doing the work. If a manager or somebody else that's uh, not directly involved in the work, indirectly involved, wants to come and see, they can come and see it. When the boards are digital, you have to make an agreement with the team. How are we going to display or have access to this so that all the people see it that need to see it? These are for the people, by the people, serving the project hope that answers the question Fratza, we have another comment or should we move on to yeah 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 uh, we have a few questions now <laughs> it's starting so uh, a little compliment who decide what tasks to go on on desk that's a so great uh, the project manager or the team right so on on this team in this particular team the project manager i'll bring back in the trello so we can see the picture so I've got uh, Trello on here. In this real example, the project manager is actually here on the board. And what they did in the beginning when they first set up, the project manager had to be a little more intentional and heavy handed with the team to say what the work is and then set those responsibilities. Remember I said this team first started, some people were just graduated from college. It's the first time they've ever worked in construction. Now the more experienced people that this is maybe their third, fourth, fifth, one of the people is their 10th project. They, they knew what to do, had a little more autonomy and responsibility. So in this board, it's flexible. The project manager or the superintendent or the site supervisor will come in and give a little more guidance, especially on setting the priority order. For example, if I'm new on this job and these are the things that I think I need to do today, talking to the superintendent and the project manager, I might find out that Checking emails is not the most important thing to do, and I'll change the sequence of my work. We might make that something that we do when the field goes home or the people on site. At the end of the day, this could be something that we do at the end of the day versus something that I do first thing. Now, if I'm in a different role, if I'm working on just change orders for the client, because yes, change does happen in construction. Remember, Heraclitus told us the change is guaranteed. I might need to put checking emails to the forefront 
because we're trying to get change orders for the the trades, the subcontractors that have put work in place already, if we're in that type of situation. Right. So that's a it's dynamic and fluid. But once it's set and the conversations had, the negotiation occurs, then we can just go through and just work, work the system, you know, item by item and pull things in when we're ready. And then continue pulling things in as the day goes on. Okay. Make sense? That's well. <clears throat> okay. Well, so we have, we have a few other questions. So sorry, oh, you have to oh, stop no your presentation. This is uh, the first so wow. it's so uh, it's no hello there. Yeah, uh, gonna, what is the biggest challenge stuff. when trying to implement Scrum Bun or Agile in general? All right. I just wanted to show that I flipped into Q&A since we're getting higher, hard Q&A on the yeah. camera. <laughs> what okay. are the hardest challenges to implement either one of these in a construction company is awareness. Uh, most people, if you're watching this live webinar right now, you've been watching me move in two different type pieces of technology, one Trello, one Mural. And I told you that this entire presentation was born inside of this Trello framework. When you first come into Trello, it's just white space or this blue, in this in particular example, blue space, there's nothing. It's wide open. I set the framework with to do, doing, done, the three stories, and then making sure that I deliver on what I promised everybody on LinkedIn, which I've captured here in the goal. The hardest thing is to get people to start with why should we do things differently? And if you're going to make that change, you have to honor and respect. You have to absolutely respect. I feel so strongly about respect for people that I'm going to have to bring up my two favorite principles right now. My name is Felipe, and I absolutely say you must have respect for people and continuous improvement follows that if you're going to start to implement these types of things in your organization. Let's turn that off. And, and just to make sure that you know that I'm dead serious, these are the two things. Again, you start with respect for people. Honor the people that are on your jobs doing the work already because they have knowledge, expertise, experience, and creativity. Honor the human beings. Bring them along with you to implement this. The goal here at the very top is to make the work easier. You make it easier for them so they can use more of their creativity, their talents, and their passions. They're in this industry by choice. So let's honor them and bring them with us. Lean and agile and scrum are things we do with people, not to people. So I hope that answers your question and bring a little enthusiasm too. Why not? So that, yes, that but the, the, the team, uh, the team have to be agree uh, with you. The team has to agree. And if you can't find everybody on the team, do it yourself and find one more person who will do it with you. And eventually you'll create some momentum and I'll share another story and I'll talk about that when we get into Scrum. So I won't forget you. Any other questions on Kanban, Francois, before we move into Scrum? Uh, yes, uh, about Kanban. Oh. How do you align the Scrum boards or Kanban boards with the six weeks uh, pool schedule? So it's from mm -hmm. last Lean Last Planner, I think. It's a great question. So now you can see that we're officially in the the Q and a on the Kanban. <laughs> so how do you align them? You start with the, the milestones first. So if you have, okay. if you're using last planner system of production controls, which is a yeah, schedule. Can you, sorry. Can you explain the, the six weeks, uh, pool schedule? Yeah. So a six week pool schedule in a construction project, let's start with construction first. It's more widely known there in a construction project, even traditional waterfall project, where we have a critical path method schedule Gantt chart. If the project is a year, two years, five years, a decade, doesn't matter. From the program, from the software, we can pull out a filtered six-week look ahead, which is from today, June 10th, to plus six weeks from now. I can look at week one, week two, week three. I can look six weeks into the future in a Gantt chart program or in something, something more visual like this. We can create that same type of framework and thinking here. You align those milestones and action steps, everything that we do, even in just a simple Kanban. If I want to set up, uh, it's not very hard to set up a, a milestone. I can just do it like this and off, you know, note it by color. Or if I wanted to get fancier, I can put it here in front of everybody so that we can see it. This is a milestone. 
the milestones, we, we make them look differently than the rest. We set it off like this, or in this program, I actually can bring in a milestone where the text will be right. In a six-week look-ahead, you should have something you're you're striving towards at the end of that time period. What you're striving towards at the end of that time period is a goal. A milestone is the start of a phase or the end of the phase, such as starting structural steel, such as building enclosure, as, as an example. Those are just examples of what a, that's a better-looking milestone, and I can definitely make the text white. I have the technology. There we go. So now that's like a milestone. So in a six week look ahead, I'll have this. This is my daily Kanban. And then I'll have milestones coming in that we're tracking towards from our look ahead schedule, which comes from the big, the projects, the main project schedule. Some people call the master schedule or just the overall contract schedule. Those things that we're doing on a daily basis should align and make progress towards this milestone. So that if I do all of this work, if our team does this and works through this framework, watch what happens. As I move forward, as, I, as the team makes more progress, we should get closer to the milestone. This is what it would look like visually. The milestone is getting closer. The more work the team does today, the closer the milestone gets to, to being you know, on deck to be done visually. Like if I'm saying that this out here to the right is the future, and this is like right now happening today, this is like today. So if we're on that final final milestone day, we've been working for six weeks on this and we've aligned. What we'll see, Hussein, is we'll see the vast majority of this work like this. And then on the final day, six weeks later, this milestone should go from being worked on to being done at the end. And you align it visually. There are other techniques, but that's beyond the scope of today's conversation. So you're going to have to get with me afterwards. I actually have a, a live stream it was recorded two weeks ago that goes into more detail on that on my YouTube channel. Find me at Felipe Engineer on YouTube and look for the live stream playlist and you'll find that video that describes that in more detail. It's a great question. Any other questions on Kanban before we go into an I Arch think it's it, there is also a question, but not on Kanban. So you, you can go on, I think. Okay, let's go. We will, we will uh, ask them uh, later. All right. So we're going to keeping keeping our boards Keeping true to the one piece flow, we're going to go into a design story now. So let's go to Mural and zoom in. I've moved the design story into doing. Now we're going to go into Scrum. So you've seen simple Kanban. One of the differences in Scrum is that we need to have a goal. So for this design team, this is based on a real, it's a true story, real design team. I'm going to, I'm going to use other alternative names to protect the innocent, the guilty and the super creative. <laughs> We're gonna say this design team, the person that brought this to their team will say their name is Al. It's not Al, but that's just what we're gonna say for today. So Al decided that he had a team goal. He decided to put Felipe on the team and we'll just make this I Al, this is Al's team. Al said, we wanna have perfectly coordinated floor plans with mechanical and structural elements to minimize healthcare workers walking distances. And there probably should be an apostrophe S there, but I'm not putting it there, so. Take it, take it up with my grammar police. Al had already learned about and implemented Kanban. And now Al wants to take his team to the next level. He's like, if I bring just a little bit more framework, we can, we can improve the struggle that Al was having with his team. And he's on a project, uh, integrated, highly collaborative project. They were missing milestone dates during the design phase. And he said, I've got to stop this and help my team. Let's invest. He paused his team. He had uh, a six person team. He paused his team and said, let's spend an hour and learn what Scrum is and see what can we implement. So voluntarily, the people knew that the reason we're doing this is because we are missing milestone dates. We're missing deadlines. So he said, okay, team, you will be the developers. They learned that developers or the, the architects, in this case, they're all architects. You need to self-organize with you know, help and support. You're going to order, plan, and create value. The designs that you're doing will be used by construction professionals and brought to life in the field soon when we when we get into that phase the scrum master the team captain al said i know scrum i've seen scrum he actually knows felipe and we've sat down at a different time and went through a little bit so he decided i'll be the team captain or the scrum master i will serve all of you and his actual title was like principal architect was his actual in real life but for this implementation he's going to act as the scrum master 
It's going to be his job. He told his team, I will eliminate roadblocks and constraints so that your work can flow. And he doesn't move their sticky notes. They, they were co-located. This is before COVID, BCE, before COVID ever. So they were co-located and they were using sticky notes to make their scrum boards and make their work visible. The product owner in this particular case was the architect who was doing the CA services or the contract administration. So the project manager of the six people, there was an on-site full-time project manager architect. They made her the product owner. She was explicitly responsible for what the team's goals were every single sprint cycle. And it was her job because she was working most closely with the owner, what was going to be highest priority and be curating the things on the backlog, which I'm going to show in a second. She wanted to make sure the backlog was visible, that people could see what's on deck, what's coming up next. And it was understood and detailed sufficiently so that the other four people understood what was coming next. And they also helped to make backlog items as well. So the first thing that they did was they needed to gain capacity. So that's why Al stopped the team for half a day so they could gain capacity and learn what is Scrum. You can learn what Scrum is for free. You click here, go to the Scrum Guides, scrum dot, scrumguides.org. It's available in over 30 languages. So if you just go here, you can read it in French too. It's in over 30 languages. So people of the world, read it for free in the language of your choice. Get after it. So the 2020 guide was there. That's the first thing that they did after they made Scrum Boards first because they jump right to Scrum Boards as people often do. And so they gained, they learned something, they paused, and then they decided to focus on value-added work. So this is part of getting together and they looked deeply at what is the framework. This is the Scrum framework in a drawing. We start with the goal first. We create that backlog. Remember, the project manager working with the client knows what is the high priority for now. The team together created the sprint plan like Sebastian showed you in the Bricks app. They have the same workflow for planning short-term on the cycle. The sprint cycle is the same as a work cycle which is the same as the sprint time box, which is the same as what in traditional design construction is the weekly work plan, as we say in lean construction. If it's a one week cycle, your sprint duration is five business days because you're not working on the weekends, but maybe you are. <laughs> I'm not working on the weekends. And with Scrum, you can stop working on the weekends too and deliver more value. So we have the team in the middle. We have Al acting as the Scrum master, they committed to doing a daily scrum and at the end of the sprint they're going to do they decided to do a two-week sprint cycle so every 10 days every 10 working days they come together and look at what they got done and do a retrospective a plus delta and some other things that I'm not going to go into some of the things that they came up with in their cards and i'll, I'll zoom back on those in a second so they're going to do value-added work they're going to minimize non-value added work. So they, one of the things they did was they eliminated their staff meeting. They used to have a, a very long staff meeting and go over issues, RFIs, submittals. They decided because they were making the work visible, they didn't need to do that anymore. And I'll show you a picture. This is a real picture from that team down here. This is a real picture from their big room. They're making the work visible with sticky notes. They've got uh, RFIs, they've got a to-do list back here, a backlog, some ASIs, cost impacts, and they've got fancy and color-coded it. And uh, let me move that back out of the way. So it's a real team using paper. They made some capacity. They decided to stop doing non-value-added work. Since we're not going to do this anymore, you don't plan to do it, it just disappears. Do only things that are valuable and necessary. So. They got together and to make the work visible, this takes a little bit of time. This sprint planning is a meeting that the team has to do because they're on a two week cycle. They know that best in class, they need to spend more than two hours planning what they're going to do. So when they were planning, they found out early on that they weren't putting enough time to planning. That's a very common mistake. They found out that they needed to go through permitting and they just came up with these things, uh, innovating for patient experience. This was an emergency department expansion um the project man like a good project manager she knew that they needed to mitigate risk support patient safety and make a plan that will help uh identify areas that you know the client might not be aware of and in this designing card they had this designing card originally 
It said, work with design partners to employ a program strategies that improve patient outcomes and enhance the standard of care the patient is in. So this, unlike Kanban, you're seeing now in Scrum, you're bringing the customer right in. The customer is right brought in front and center. When you read the Scrum Guide, it'll be even more obvious than I'm making it now. But I just want to show that as a, as a differentiator. Let's even like put a line around this. Like Now we've got the customer front and center. I mean, we saw a patient experience over here. But we also have it here in the planning. Now, this card is too big. When they went to go plan and they broke this down, as they're having this planning conversation, they said, you know what? This is bigger than a day's worth of work. So they broke that down into two more steps. Resolving all interdisciplinary conflicts. And this is just live at the time. It wasn't like they went back to the beginning of the job. This is like, it's week 37, and we got to just do this right now where we are. We're just going to start this where we are. And at that specific moment in time, they had interdisciplinary conflicts in the federated model in BIM. They had conflicts they needed to overcome clashes with other design disciplines. And they said, if we're going to do this right, we also got to get the floor plans conflict-free, all the notes resolved from level one to level four. This card could be broken down a little more, but it's their first time. Cut them some slack. I mean, every time I see an architect start to do scrum, I automatically got to celebrate and drop some confetti and my heart just grows like two times in size when they make the work visual. You feel me, Francois? So they take all that in the planning and they bring those cards up and they're doing this with like paper cards. So they had their backlog and they figure out what they're going to do first. And they, they negotiate what the order is having a conversation. They may figure out that this needs to go first. Then they need to do the planning and then, then they're going to start to maybe do this card. And then these cards are going to happen after some of that work gets done. And that's just what they think when they start. And right away, the most common mistake is that they took too much into the to-do list. See how this bottom is open? See how there's open space here? Like I could add, I could stack more stuff. I could bring this in here too. But now I'm over committing to what can be done. Everybody listening, when you first start using Scrum, don't overcommit. Start smaller than you think you should. Back up a little bit. If you have four people on your team, taking three things in is a good first step. Get some data, get some repetition, seeing what it's like. Remember, they had a pause for half a day just to learn this. The Scrum Guide's 12 pages, but it takes time to digest it and then put it into flow here. I think what Al did to his credit with his team was he said, like, this is going to be slow. It's going to feel awkward but I'm going to support you so we can start meeting deadlines. And what happened is as they went through this and started to work, it transformed for them. This is what the, the project manager told me. She pulled me to the side. I came back to visit this job and she said, until we started doing scrum, I was honestly considering leaving the construction industry. When we started doing scrum and we brought the client front and center into what we're doing, it was one of the first times, and I've been in this industry for over a decade, that we connected at a very real, hands-on level what we're doing in the design with how it's affecting patient outcomes. Not to say that it didn't happen before in her career, but she says, I can see a direct tie to what I just put on my board and what's going to happen with patient care in this hospital that we're designing. And she's like, I am re-energized to stay in construction. And I said, let me hit record on my phone so I can get that on the record. <laughs> I didn't I didn't get it on the record, but I have a decent memory. Mm. So it so took more awesome. sense. Uh, yeah. I mean, it made it so real things. and connected the person back in. And like, this is Jeff Sutherland who co-created Scrum with Ken Schwaber. And what Jeff just, I just heard Jeff on the phone this week. He said, one of the main reasons that drove me to create this framework in the first place was to give people the freedom to do more of what they want, to give people choice and to allow them to be fully creative and present at work. And I said, man, Jeff, if you were only on mural right now, I'll be dropping confetti on you. So that that's for you. Do we have any questions, Francois? We can pause for a quick question here before. Uh, I can... Yeah, we have a question about um, uh, the the when you, yeah you talk about Scrum, but yes, in reality there is a lot of uh, 
uh, used in uh, in the construction industry. You have the architects, the engineers, uh, and so how do you break all this uh, uh, <clears throat> this uh, uh, way of working that we are all used to? And uh, and how we say, okay, tomorrow we will work totally differently. And uh, yes, you have the Erify. Everybody is from different companies, so it's not so easy to. Uh, to put that's all everybody question. together in the same uh it's same absolutely way. not easy and that's when i said you've got to honor and i showed it twice respect for people i'm going to zoom in on that one to the the five scrum values that make it work this is i stole this from scrum.org earlier today these are the five values that not only are the scrum values but these were identified by ken schwaber decades ago when they looked at high performing teams teams that are meeting their goals, supporting each other, have a high level of trust. These are the five characteristics and values that the, that most of the team had. Commitment is not listed at the top in this infographic, but Jeff taught me commitment is the most important thing. So for you starting this with your team, if you commit, you yourself decide, as I decided, I'm going to commit to achieving the goals for this project, I'm going to commit to using Scrum to make my work easier. You will start to get into the others and you will start to attract people to you. I just heard from, I heard today from Stephanie who asked a question earlier. She told me that she was on uh, a manufacturer's website in here in North America and they were advertising hiring a Scrum master and asked me if I knew about it. And like, not only did I know about it, but I trained one of the first Scrum masters in their organization earlier this year. And I said, how fast and how amazing is it? One person got the knowledge, made the commitment, and now the organization is advertising and created another job. I got to tell Jeff, like I got to high five Jeff. Scrum is making more work for people, employing more people to do good work. Oh, I just love it. So commitment is the way you get it with the team. And then if you're going to do it, once you decide, like, we must do this, like, I like what Felipe is showing, this is good stuff. You've got to use respect and be open to people's skepticism. It's okay that people are like reserved and thinking like they're going to go on Google or go on YouTube, send them to my channel. So they, they go to the good stuff and don't go to all the other stuff. We have a plethora of stuff in design and construction. And even uh, Scrum Inc. has a LinkedIn group as well. I'll put a link in the in the chat when i'm done talking after the stream ends so that people can join in and see all the other people worldwide working in design and construction and with case studies as well and and people helping because you're not going to have to do it by yourself we'll help we will absolutely help you to make that transformation on your project any other questions francois we are in the q a for the first design example uh, yeah um we have a uh previous question uh what i see here well, has a pieces of integrated project delivery so it's another uh, way of working do you recommend any set that a middle manager in the chain of command do i recommend a middle manager let's go back to my my beautiful architect board here and we had uh, a middle manager so let's look we want to do more value-added work we want to minimize non-value added work that's necessary if for legal compliances or contract compliances because the client wants it and sees a value in it we have to have a middle manager say even a construction manager on a project then that's what the client wants i always say give the client what they want and not anything extra they're going to be so wowed and so satisfied with just giving them what they asked for that it's going to be value added for them value is subjective it is in the eye of the beholder. So if it makes sense and your contract requires it, then I said, do it. But if you want to add in another individual on top of this team, this is remember I'd said scrum is designed to have the smallest amount of bureaucracy necessary to allow flow to occur. So you can achieve your goals. That is the name of the game. We don't do scrum to win awards, even though I will drop confetti on you. If I find out you're doing scrum, John, I'm watching you, John. You better connect with me on LinkedIn. Confetti will be dropped for you. You don't want to add in additional people to the team beyond these three different sets. The develop the, the developers or the scrum team, the team handles everything. An integrated project delivery, you might call them 
a project implementation team, or you might call them a work cluster, a cluster team. Those are very common team names in IPD, integrated project delivery. Those teams are also self-organized. Those teams also order, plan, create value. And those teams should be learning and adapting. Guess where IPD got the idea for creating a work cluster? If you guess Scrum, you go to the top of the class because that's where they borrowed it from. Yes, I, I know where you got it. It's all good. <laughs> for you, it's more easy to, to implement Scrum in this type of organization or? Yeah, is it is there a specific easy. type of organization that are uh, uh, easier? To yeah, if, if you're in an IPD contract, Francois, I often see teams working in clusters using Scrum. But I work in California, west of the Rocky Mountains. We have a lot, a higher uh, penetration of agile and Scrum usage and last planner system in general. And as well as some, some of my friends in Canada where IPD is even larger there, it's been widely adopted by parts of the government, especially in, the, in school building, the school construction in Canada. There's an, there's an IPD group in Canada as well, has a lot, a lot of free information on their websites, as well as my friend who's here in the United States who runs Lean IPD website, James Pease. He has a lot of free information. If you want to learn more about what integrated project delivery is, I, I recommend, or someone remind me in the chat to put in a link to the website, leanipd.com. And he's got a ton of free content on there to explain what IPD is, how is it a contracting methodology? And he has his own YouTube channel where he explains it in much more detail. But I absolutely, the last three random IPD jobs I went to, I saw people doing Scrum on all three of those. So I think that high intensity collaboration lends itself to doing this agile type of framework that I know and love. I mean, let me put another heart on here and let's, let's celebrate that heart. So yes, it I, definitely makes it easier. But the first time I did scrum, listen to me. First time I did scrum was a hard bid, a traditional design bid build. And it mm -hmm. worked like a charm. It's worked. I still get Christmas cards from people on that job. They had such a great time. And so, you you do question. it always with all the the people of the project, or just for one company? You do it uh, where it makes sense to start, and then you expand out as you need to. So if you're thinking like I can't do it unless this entire 500 people on my job does it, you're thinking the wrong way. You need to think who can I partner with now? Who who needs help? Even like if somebody has like a perfect system, you know, let them be. Work with people that need help first and then expand out as it makes sense. And there have been a couple of projects that I've been a part of where uh, more than half of the team started using Scrum, but there were some people that just chose not to. And that's okay. It, they're not ready at the time. Some of these ideas are more caught than taught. And I'd say if, if, you, if you're going at this, they're going to see the people having fun. I mean, who would say no to any of these values? Who would say no? to acting courageously at work, being focused on the task, being committed to serve the project, respecting each other, and being open to ideas from anywhere on the team. Nobody would say no to that. But if I showed, if I just showed you this at a glance and I didn't explain it to you and then slow down with you and listen to what you're, how can I make this tailored for design? Like how, why should I break this card up into two cards instead of being one card? If I don't slow down and bring people with me, then I'm not respecting them and it's not going to work. So you scale it to when it makes sense. But we definitely have projects in the construction industry now where, like I said, people in the trades are using this to help them with productivity as well as people in the office. So it's a great question. We're still in the Q&A, Francois? I'm, I'm, yeah, and, and about the Scrum Master, you have the free, uh, free uh, role of the Scrum. But uh, welcome... Uh, who is the Scrum Master for you? Is it uh, an old uh, project manager? Is it uh, a B manager, for example? Or what do you think? Those are great questions. So, not do, every. Do you have to hire yeah. someone else? So I got to give you a disclaimer, Francois. Not yeah. every project uses BIM. <laughs> Yes, so, yes, yes, yes. Also, know, you are in a an agile BIM meetup, so <laughs> I know. An agile, so people, oh, yeah, a BIM manager absolutely could be a Scrum Master, hundred percent. So let's look at the Scrum Master for a second. So here I've I've distilled down from the Scrum Guide, which I'm gonna pop open in, in ten seconds here. They have to know this process. So in order in order to be the Scrum Master and serve the team and scrum master and product owner absolutely are pulling work off the backlog and they're doing the work too. 
So remember in the architect's case, this was a, a project manager. She was also doing design work as well. She wasn't just like setting back and watching this from afar. She's in there doing the work with the team. And Al was acting as the scrum master who, hap who happened to be just coincidentally the principal architect of, of the office. He wasn't on site every day of the week, but he was the, the scrum master for the team. And as the team matures, you, you want to have it, it can switch as they get more practice. And eventually, eventually a very mature scrum team doesn't need a scrum master or they can alternate different people can play the scrum master at different times. But in the beginning, when you're first starting out, they have to know that framework. And if I go to the scrum guide and I go down and find scrum master here and the scrum guide, the scrum master is accountable. That means that they're responsible that people are going to do scrum following the framework. Now, once you start to iterate through some cycles with your team, the scrum master will help the team shift away from things in the framework that don't make sense for them and make it the method so that it's their method serving their team. And they're guiding people through the theory, which is part of the beliefs, like the values, and then also with in the organization as well, because they have to protect the team at different times so they can do the work. And there's more description there. Check it out online for free. Shameless plug. Read it. It's free. Get it. So that's that's my advice. It's not always going to be a PM. Uh, on the case of, of a construction case, in that case, it was not a PM. It was actually a senior project engineer became the scrum master of the team. And the project manager was, was not. The project manager made more sense based on his expertise for a general contractor to be the product owner of the team. And the project engineer, the senior project engineer, was the scrum master. I have other teams that I've worked with where in virtual design and construction, the, pro the director of the group is acting as the scrum master for the group in VDC, in virtual design construction, or using, you know, primarily using BIM and other visualization technology. So it's, Francois, it's, it's whoever knows the framework the best should be the scrum master. And they, they do need to have the ability to facilitate a meeting and lead. If you're going to lead, that means that people have to follow you. And if you're a leader today, that means you at least know how to be a good follower yourself. And what you're following as the scrum master is you're following Jeff Sutherland, Ken Schwaber, and the thousands of millions of scrum masters now that have set up some good practices for us to help serve our teams effectively and understand how to navigate through this framework, regardless of what industry you're in, what domain you're in. So that's a, that was a fantastic question. Are we still got some more Q and A for this design scrum or we want to go into a construction? Yeah, so Ron say, okay, everyone can be a scrum master. And I so also ask a question about uh, time frame from the sprints. What do you recommend? Okay. Weekly, to you talk about two weeks? That's my friend. Hey, Juan. It's great to see you, Juan, on the yeah. on the live stream. So here we have the entire framework uh, for a, a team in construction. The most natural, if your construction project is, you know, commercial construction, school, hospital, uh, even some larger healthcare, multifamily, or even attendant improvement. If, you're, if your schedule is big enough that your entire project is going to go at about a year or more, it makes sense. It's nat Your natural cycle in construction is monthly. Most teams, every four weeks, have things that they repeat every four weeks. So the easiest cycle for a sprint is four weeks. Now, the problem with that is it's a big batch. So I would, I would advise teams to try and experiment with of one week cycle to start. And as we poll people every year, uh, there's a couple of scrum organizations that do some surveys. We find that the most common sprint duration, this time box where people can go through this entire cycle, the most common is now five days. And if you look at your Outlook calendar or your Google calendar, or whatever you're using for your calendar, I bet you know that you are gonna be here today, at least by Monday. I mean, we've been advertising this for how long, friends? Well, like two weeks at least. Yeah. <laughs> so some of you signed up right away. And so two weeks into the future, you predicted that you'd be here live with us <laughs> to see this stuff. And so you're, the smaller you can make that cycle, the more reliable it is. And the more reliable it is, the better it serves the team. But at the end of that cycle, Juan, you have to have something that you can review. So for some teams, five days is too small 
because they're the type of work that they do doesn't produce something that they can actually look at and get feedback on. So you might need to go to a two week cycle, but my advice is whatever you start with to pick, you can always pick four weeks to start and then work your way down after a couple of sprints. You want to get a couple of repetitions, help the team. And then as a team decides, should we flip to a smaller cycle? I've got one scrum team now uh, working in the, in a support group in a construction company and they are on a two week cycle and they experimented first with the, the four week and they found that as they started to accelerate and increase their throughput, four weeks was too big and they decided collectively to shrink it down to two weeks. And then I'm still encouraging them to think about experimenting one more time and getting it to a one week because they are creating increments of value every, on the weekly basis. So it makes sense. Totally when, makes sense. When you use BIM, you could you could use the uh, the iteration of the BIM model. So when you share the BIM model, it could be an iteration also. That's right. Every time you have something that you can get exposed to, just like Francois said, that was a perfect example, Francois. You know what? Go to the top of the class right now. You just went to the head of the class, and that gets confetti. Thank you. If you're, if you're producing that updated federated BIM model on a weekly basis, or maybe even every three days, if you're using Scrum, if you're using Bricks, right, you could you could be doing a BIM model every three days. <laughs> Shameless plug to the sponsor. Thank you, Bricks, for sponsoring this live stream. <laughs> you can absolutely make that the cycle. Uh, and then we often see, too, that some people will use the Scrum framework in a meeting, and they'll take a two-hour meeting, and they'll Scrum the meeting, and then they'll have that go through, you know, at the end of two hours. Like, this is Scrum right now. I mean, when this is over, we're still in the design Q&A. You can see that we're in jeopardy of not finishing the construction story, but we are not in jeopardy of getting the online resources. I'll make sure you get those because I have the technology. So it's all good. All good. Any other questions on the design? Yeah, yeah. We have a question of David Delgado, uh, who, who, who are presenting a, a, another meetups a few, a few months ago. How to deal with the trend to mislead user stories just uh, as an item for the traditional waterfall plan? In, in your, our experience, this is one of the more difficult tasks for experimented PM guys. Okay. So David I'll, Delgado I'll... is also practicing. Uh, so hello, David. He's also practicing uh, Scrum and oh, Trello. Okay. So. His hearts are for you, David. I told I told people listening that if, if I heard somebody was using Scrum, you're getting confetti. So that's for you, David. <laughs> Excellent. So yeah, the user story thing, user stories are, we borrowed from extreme programming. Um, thank you. That's extreme. I, I'm forgetting the name of the person that came up with it, but these cards that I've listed here, I took from the architect. So the architect had these cards and they had very task oriented cards. Now for the example of today, I took these cards and I broke them back into user story format. And that's, how did I do that? I have experience with what a user story is. So let's go to this design one, for example, because this one we broke down. I think this will hit what David needs. So David, when you're working with your team, when you have, if this is my backlog, and let's say originally this is my backlog, David, the, the architect, one of the people on the team said that we need to work with other design partners to employ program strategies to improve patient outcomes. It's kind of like it's too big. It's too nebulous. I mean, this is something that we're doing. Arguably, they're already been doing this. Right, one of the, they're starting to do this. No, they've been doing this. This is secretly dark work that's in doing right now all the time. So what you, what you want to do is an experienced person in user stories, and there is a great format for user stories. I recommend anybody who wants a deep dive in user stories go to mountgoatsoftware.com. Mike Con, C O L N, has a great YouTube channel, and he talks about user stories. I mean, he wrote the book on user stories, literally. So check his stuff out. That's where I learned how to break this user story down. So this is close to reality. And I, and I said, I put this in an outline black box because it's too vague. One of the criteria, when things get to the top of the backlog this close, I should be able to pull this card in and know what to do without having to explain it to people. And because you can tell how vague it is, I can't do that. So it does not meet the criteria to get pulled into sprint planning. It needs to get broken up. So let's leave it there. As, and we'll call it an epic, which is just a very big story. And we'll say, if we ask the design team, in order to do that, working with the other partners, they might say, well, to get this accomplished, we'll need to resolve interdisciplinary conflicts. 
to which me, I'll say, with who? Do we have structural? Do we have mechanical? Are we just conflicting with the interior's design or is this architectural elements? Get specific. So you ask them to get specific and David with training, they'll start to do it and they'll see how it benefits them. Then they might also say, okay, in order to resolve these conflicts, now they're getting more specific. And this could be another architect on the team. They're going to say, okay, we need the floor plans to be conflict free. Where? What floor plans? Level one to four. Okay, that could be, I could make a card for each floor. Each resolving conflicts on every floor could be something that takes me a day. I tell people as a rule of thumb, when you're back here in backlog, these things can be, this is totally okay to be this vague in backlog. If it's if it's down the ways, if it's down here, like it's okay. But the closer it gets to like what's going to happen next, like so if this is my backlog like this, the closer that this design moves up, I need to start getting those user stories dialed in so that I, I know what the tasks are and it makes sense to everybody. And then we know when it's going to finish. Like So when this, when this card moves over to done, sorry, Jeff, when this card moves to done, well, Jeff's like, you can't cover me up, Felipe. Then we know that there are no conflicts. And if, if I see this card here, how in the world could this other card still be out here? It's impossible. How could I have conflicts on this? I know just by the how these are written, David, that this is going to come after this. When all of these conflicts happen, and maybe I make four cards out of here, then this will be done and we can call it. We can cover Jeff up and he won't get upset. Jeff's like, you can't cover me up, Felipe. I know, Jeff. You can't be covered up. <laughs> so it takes practice. And there are some definitely, there's a good formula for user stories. And I'll just show, I'm going to give everybody this link now in the chat somehow. Maybe I'll, I'll figure out. You'll get all linked to this. And in here, I just want to show you, David, if you click on this, most basic Trello scrum board. It's going to open up a public Trello site and I've got user story examples here on the right. So if you scroll over, David, this is for you. This is the template. This is the formula that Mike shared with the world as a type of user. So this could be architect, engineer. It could be like a nurse, a doctor, whoever is going to benefit from your design. I want some goal so that for some reason. And that's why you should write your stories. This is the best story template example. So I think I have a design example here. No, I don't have a design example. So check that out here. There's some more resources there. And I got a link to Mike's website there. I'll put that in the chat. That's awesome. Like, It's a great, uh, great thing. So be patient, show people the way, and then encourage them with positive reinforcement like that. Not necessarily like that. That's not, <laughs> you know, in your way, David, encourage them in your way. Yeah. And, and let me just give you a rule of thumb before I let Francois bring the next question. When you make your stories in sprint backlog or the to-do list, they should be small enough that the team can accomplish it in a single workday. This is best in class based on millions of people doing scrum. If I have a story like this one, that's so gigantic that it's going to span multiple days I can't get flow. My batch is too big and I'm just doing traditional waterfall. But if I break this up into those tasks, now I can get flow. Now I can make negotiations and handoffs. I can do so many more things that I could not do before I made the work visible. So keep that in mind, best practice. And if something is so teeny tiny that it's less than 15 minutes of effort, it doesn't make sense to make it visual. Just take care of it. But if it's some real human effort, it's going to take you some time during the day and these tasks all involve time, risk, creativity, technical work. That's all here. That's a great question. Francois, go ahead. We're back to Q&A. Yeah, 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 yeah. We have uh, so much questions. So we have a question of uh, Spencer. Is there a number of cards in backlog that you know that either your functional team is too big or the amount of work or scope is too much? Yeah, so, let's go down to, I'm going to just jump. Thank you. It's good to see Spencer, another friend. Hey, Spencer, what's up? So here, here's a team, a construction team that we're not, we're not even here yet. Uh, so the, the early answer is no. There's no such thing as too many things in backlog. So long as they are fit for the team's purpose. So in this example, this is a general contractor's team, and their team goal is to build a healthy place in our world. They're working on a uh, sustainability project in a major city in the middle of the country. 
And that's, that's their team goal. They want to build a healthy building, healthy place. And it's just, we pulled out the building's name to protect the innocent and the creative. When they put this all together, they had uh, a big component of estimating. And one of the things that they, they found out was that there was a lot of breaking of this down and it could be, it, look, look how messy it is. It's totally this messy, hundred percent. It could be this messy when it starts off. Now, when they go into the framework, Spencer, in the framework, optional, not in the scrum guide, but optional is to do something called backlog refinement. So we have this backlog here is where we start. It's the wish list of everything that we want to get done so that this project is a success for everybody. And you actually, you can make money on a job too. Uh, surprise, all the projects that we build for owners, they generate revenue or serve a purpose if they're nonprofits. So nothing wrong with making a little bit of coin. So in that backlog refinement, the team will take time to look at this and say, wow, gee golly, this is a mess. What's the most important thing? So the product owner is responsible for keeping this nice and tidy and making sure that it's always in the, the right priority order based on the goal for the sprint that's on deck or coming up. So if I'm just organizing this, pretending I'm putting my product owner hat on, and I might know that this is something that the team, the team has already broken up this estimating card. I did talk to a team. I was at a conference, Spencer, and someone came up to me after the conference. They, they're actually working for a software company that's a household name that we all know. And some of us are using on our construction projects right now. And the person said, Felipe, uh, I love the presentation. So that gets, uh, we're using Scrum. So that got confetti right away. They said, but our product, our backlog has over 3,000 items in it. I was like, wow. I was like, how many items? Over 3,000 items. I was like, wow, your product owner is just wow. saying yes to everything. You like that, Francois? Yeah, yes. You're like, yeah. what? 3,000 <laughs> items? What? I know. It's terrible. That's the product owner is responsible for what the team delivers, but the the word that all product owners need to practice using is the word no. Sometimes it doesn't make sense for the team. And some of those things of the 3000 items could be condensed down. Like if we're getting close to when this is going to happen, it makes sense to break this. I'm going to put a, a black box around this. This estimating card gets broken down into these three cards by the team. But when I'm early on the job, before I'm into contracting, it might just be the one card, right? So my backlog could be, you know, just like this. This could be my backlog. It's just these cards. But then as we get closer, like it's innovating is going to go first, then managing, so on. As we get closer, the product owner and the team during backlog refinement, which is optional in and Scrum, it's not even mentioned in the Scrum Guide currently, but you want to tidy this up, then you might have to break this down. You should break it down. Like we talked about that David reminded us that user stories are important. And user stories, stories is how we think. That's how we think about things anyway, in a story form. So keep your backlog. When you're doing that refinement, Spencer, there are going to be times you're like, you know what? We're, we're not going to get into this permitting issue now. This is a private job and this other authority that we thought we had, we don't actually have anymore. So just delete that bad boy. Oh, felt so good. Ah, oh, taking stuff off the backlog that doesn't make sense just feels good. Let's get some confetti for that too, Francois. Any other questions on, uh, on backlog before I bring that card back? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we have another question and it's, uh, it's the, the continuity of uh, the question of uh, David. It's, it's about uh, uh, to how to finish a, a task. So, uh, so Magdalena, hello Magdalena. Uh, she has, how can we deal with tests? So it's another aspect of the agile practices, the, the test. We, we don't speak about that, uh, I think. Uh, how can we deal with tests during the sprint in the process of BIM model creation to not That's push them at the end of the sprint? So let's take, this, let's take this board here as an example. Actually, let's go into this board in Trello. And let's make, a, <clears throat> we'll make this Q&A card temporarily become a test card. Or if we're in this process, Magdalena, that's a great question. So if, she, she, sorry, she, she speak about in another comment about, uh, we, we don't speak about also the definition of done. It yeah, would be we, interesting to, uh, to help to finish tasks. Okay. In, in the scrum guide, let's go to the, let's go to the guide first, the framework, the definition of done 
is set by the team. And it's, it's actually here in the guide and people, a lot of people like to jump over that. You, you don't need to jump over. I just hit control F and find the word done. And there it is. So the developers will create that definition of done. Done means that when it moves from doing it's complete and we don't touch it again. If you have to do testing, make a card for testing or make a column. If you're in a, if your framework is, and I'll, I'll go back to Trello. If your framework involves that, then you need to set that. There are, there's another, look at 22 times the word done shows up in the scrum guide. Let's find the, how can we d decide what gets done this sprint? So let me go back to my picture. Picture's worth a thousand words. So in my picture, Magdalena, if I have stuff that doesn't meet this goal, why is it on my scrum board? If I have to test so that the work is complete and it, it's coordinated, it works, it's, it's scope in contract, it matches, it meets the programming requirements, it meets the BIM standards that we've set through our BIM execution plan, because I know that you probably have a BIM execution plan because you just look organized to me based on your picture. Good job, that gets confetti. Good organized people doing scrum. Change your framework. Let's change the framework here. We'll take this example and let's just change this up. Let's zoom in. And if we have to, before we do, let's, let's back this up. Let's go like this and then let's add a card for testing. If we do some work and then we have to go into a testing environment or a, a clashing environment, why not just do that? Change our workflow, right? Do we have the technology? Yeah, we do. If our flow with our BIM team is that we're going to organize, prioritize, we'll still have a backlog, we'll still have a to-do list. What we're doing this, this cycle, like Francois said, we'll go from model update to model update as the cycle. We'll do the work where we actually create the elements, do the coordination, bring the things in, give the attributes to all the BIM elements so that our, our estimators can see what's going on or whoever, whatever stakeholder needs to see it. And then do the testing like we talked about, and this is something very common in software. If the testing flow goes, if we go from getting the work done to testing, and our definition of done as a BIM professional means it's done when it's fully tested, then we move it to done. So just introducing this column in your Scrum framework is totally acceptable and highly encouraged. And you will get confetti from me if you send me a picture of your Scrum board via LinkedIn direct message. Oh, absolutely. This is confetti. Just thinking you're going to send me your updated picture. I want to see a before and after picture, if you'll be so kind. And then you'll get these hearts as well. So Magdalena, that's uh, that's my challenge to you to just introduce this into your framework. And if, and if your framework is testing first and then doing whatever final touches for export, if that makes more sense for you, then switch it to make sense for you and your team. Do an experiment. Try it out. And we see what works. And as a meetup with Magdalena to present this. Yeah, that would be awesome. Yeah, that's I'm I'm doing all the confetti for that, Francois. While you bring up the next question. Okay, Unless no, we... you can go on. Oh, awesome people! Welcome people. Here we go. So now we're gonna update the board. That's beautiful. We've got I've got two construction stories. Let me get the oh my god, I feel so good. Get the credit there. So we've got a construction story. Okay, so we have a construction team. Thanks to Spencer, we've already pulled the backlog up. This team decided that we're going to go full scrum. We're going to bring in a scrum master. We're going to do all of the scrum. We're going to go three, five, three. You're like three, five, three, Felipe, what are they going to do? They're going to have three roles. We're going to say project director, you are going to be the product owner. And the project director is onboarded to understand that they are responsible for what the team delivers. They will help to prioritize they will be the voice of the customer and they will spend time with the client and the other parts of the team to bring back to this team so that that backlog stays visible and understood by all people. So on this particular team, it was the, the product direct, I'm sorry, the project director, the scrum master on this team is the project manager. He was the one that knew scrum the best and he elected himself to that role, which is always the right choice. Like if you want to, if you feel compelled to be the captain, Take it. I will confetti you all day long. And then the team were project engineers and administrative assistant. So that was the team. So there were seven people team. They were going to do five meetings or the five scrum events, which includes print planning, 
and there it is on Mondays. They were decided to do sprint planning on Mondays. They're going to sprint for a five day cycle. Every five days, they're going to sprint, which is just their cycle. They're going to do a daily scrum. The product manager, who's now acting as the scrum master, the team captain, let's just say his name is Matt. Matt said, Hey, team, in order to go full on scrum, I'm going to, in place of our staff meeting, we're going to do these daily standups. Let's try it for a week and see if we still get what we need done. And in exchange for that team, you're going to make your work visible on the scrum board that I just bought you from Home Depot. Shout out to Home Depot. And uh, before all of this commodity problems, this is before COVID, <laughs> and it was easy to get whiteboards off the shelf. Uh, you'll expose your work in exchange. I will delete my issues log, which everybody celebrated instantly because nobody loves an issues log, especially if you're a <laughs> general contractor and, and your name is tied to an issue. Ooh, let's get rid of that. And so they tried it and it worked. And at the end of the week, they did a quick review to see what they got done. They got feedback from the client that the director brought back to the team. And sometimes the scrum master, Matt, product manager, pro project manager, coincidentally, he was coincidentally the PM, would bring feedback as well. And then they would do a retrospective to see how is the team working? And they'd ask a couple of questions, which I won't go into in the retrospective. There's a lot of good stuff on for free. You can read in the scrum guide about how to do that better. In the beginning, they did not do backlog refinement. They didn't, they didn't need to when they were first starting out. As they got more sophisticated and they started accelerating, they needed to because they started running out of things to do and they were getting ahead. So what I want to show on this team is that what they found when they got into this, where I'll put uh, Matt as the scrum master. That's not a name. I can say that that's the name for purposes of today. And their team had their administrative assistant. There was a... Uh, there was a few people. There were seven total. So that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And we'll say that the the PO, the PO's name is Poe. Just uh just name. So Poe was acting as the product owner. Matt was the PM, and then everybody else was on the team. And what they found was when they first started, is that the team was struggling to take on extra work that the client was giving them. So they're working on a hundred plus million dollar patient hospital. They're using last planner system to plan and schedule the work in the field in the hospital building. And the owner, because they're here says, Oh, we got this little project. Can you give us a number and do this as a change order to the big job, which is super common in the United States all over every hospital project I've ever seen ever in my entire career, 20 plus years. It's very common. <laughs> And as a change order to just take care of this little thing, like it could be like painting a wall as simple as that is to changing a hallway around or adding bathrooms somewhere else. And so they found that with the patient bed tower, before they started using scrum, they had a Saturday schedule. They're working on Saturdays and they're just barely keeping up. And this is a high performing team. This is a team that has worked together for over three years, knows each other well, has barbecues, goes to each other's houses for dinner sometimes. I mean, this is a high-performing, cohesive team, but just doing lean is not getting them twice the work and half the time. So Matt picks up. We They bring me in. We go over what this is with the team. They start using it, and they were about to hire people to do some of this extra work that the client was giving them this change order work on these small projects. These small projects ranged from anywhere from $10,000 to upwards of $6 million on top of the $100 million hospital. In the beginning, they thought they had to hire two more people. Once they started using Scrum, they didn't have to hire anybody. They stopped working Saturdays. The very first time that they went through the cycle, and this will not be true for everybody, but the very first time they went through the full cycle with these meetings, they didn't work on Saturday. They didn't have to to stay on top of the work. And then as they got more done, the next time I came to visit them, randomly, unknown to, the, to me that this would happen, the client walked in and we were looking at their scrum board and the office and the client gave them a signed proposal for another $2 million job that was somewhere else on the campus to do. And that was, I asked the PM, Matt, I said, Matt, and Matt's not his real name. Remember, this is a fictitious story to protect the creative. I asked Matt, it's like, 
is this just happening like all the time now? He's like, yeah. He's like, we're, we're running six projects in parallel with the, the patient hospital. I was like, with the same staff? I, he was like, yeah, with the same staff. I was like, what? I just had to bring it back, Francois, because I know how much you love that record scratch. You're right. <laughs> and, and the client said, he said, we are happy to have you here. And the people in the hospital can't say enough about the quality of the work that you're doing. And everybody on the team, Francois, was like calm. They were all calm and happy and they were not overworked. And they were doing more than twice the work because now they're doing that $100 million job, which is going amazing. All the trade partners are making money, which is nothing wrong with that. That's great. They're using last planner system. The office side doing all of the project management administration is using Scrum on the office work. And now they're able to handle an additional five projects to six projects more with the same staff. The project director is just sitting back and just counting all of the profit increases for the team. And the owner is super, super satisfied getting just exactly what they wanted. And that's the name of the game. Like we want to do something to benefit the client. That's what we want to do. That's the point. So that's that's that team using the five meetings and it didn't happen overnight. Like it took time and negotiation. The longest person, the longest holdout for this team was actually the administrative assistant. We're going to say that uh, we'll call her Tina. Tina's not her real name, but we'll say Tina. Tina resisted scrum. She's like, I don't need to do scrum for 12 months. She resisted, resisted and resisted. And the PM was this very calm Matt's like, hey, Tina, how's it going? Tina's like, I'm doing fine. Don't come over here with that scrum stuff, Matt. I'm, I'm good. I got it. I don't need it. Matt's like, okay, no worries. We'll let you, uh, you know, if you change your mind, we're here. I'll get you a board and uh, we'll talk about it later. So after a while, Tina saw, she started getting more curious of what was going on. She started coming closer to the team. And eventually she said, okay, Matt, I see how you guys are working, how you've been working. And I want to try this. So she joins the scrum team. I mean, she was already on the team, but now she actually joins in the scrum team and starts participating in these other things. Now what happens with Tina, I got to show a picture. This is Tina's board. Remember, Tina's not a real name. Tina makes this scrum board herself. She designs this board herself. She has tracking. She has backlog. Then she has doing. Then she has done. And I, and I told Tina, I said, don't worry about having two things and doing. I'll slap your hand later. Because in Scrum, we do one thing at a time. One piece flow, baby. <laughs> You're not doing these two things simultaneously. Nice try. So we, and she's got insurance tracking on the right. And then down below, she has some other things. This, All of this stuff down below is her extended backlog. She has project closeout. She has front-end contract tracking with the trade partners. And she has uh, payment checks as checks are cashed and payments are received for work done in place and goes through the entire framework, all done by herself. Now, what happens? Let's go back to, let's go back to this. This happened with Matt saying, Hey, if you want to, and Matt being committed, consistent and focused and respectful, Tina eventually said, this looks valuable and I'll try it. And when she tried it, Tina is to the best of my knowledge, the only administrative assistant that is operating on three projects simultaneously. She can serve three projects. Could you imagine having one person on your team that can do an, a high quality job and serve three projects simultaneously? I mean, that is Tina. Tina's not your real name, but this confetti is for you. And I will call you today and high five you again when I see you in a month. But that is just phenomenal. And it took time. Matt had to address all of her concerns about how this would work and affect her work and how could it make sense and, and she could adapt it for herself to be in the framework. And I think that is one of the most powerful things about this whole framework is that it allows people to bring that creativity. Her scrum board, in my eyes, is a work of art that deserves even more confetti. And again, how many projects was she serving, Francois? Three. I know. I was like, I told Matt, I was like, you better give her a raise because this is ridiculous. Like how much output she has. And I mean, she is funny and caring and always has a huge smile on her face. I'm always happy to be greeted by her when I come visit their job. 
to this day. So that's awesome. Any questions on uh, on that so far? I've got another story to tell, but I'm I'm open for some Q and A. Yeah, well. no, 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 no. Uh, just uh, Moro Pavel. Uh, he say thank you so much. Uh, he take it. He's taking a lot on lot of notes and he, he will rewatch the, the the video a lot of time. So yes, there is a lot of information tonight. <laughs> um, yeah. I'm not even showing you everything, friends. So I'm holding back. Yeah, so it's a uh, one hour and a half uh, for the moment. Uh, so we, we we can go on and uh, and we, we do uh, another meetups if we need. Yeah, let's keep going. I've got uh, another story to share. So that was that was this team here. I'm going to use the same board. And I'm going to zoom in and tell another story about an estimating team. So I'm just going to push that to the side. And so we've got uh, a team here. Let me use this to kind of hide. Here's the before, the before picture. You know what? I could actually, I just, now that's good enough. That'll, that'll work. So it's just, can I, maybe I can turn this white or something. I don't know. Well, I'll just, I'll just share the punchline. <laughs> All right, so we have a team, and this case study that I'm going to share here is going to be in the link. So I'm going to give everybody the link. That case study I'm about to show you, if you go to this link that I'm going to give everybody when the call is over, come in here. This is my thank you to all of you, and thank you, Francois and Sebastian, again, and thank you, Bricks, for making this time. There is a link here on the left side, which you click on, will take you to Scrum Inc.'s website. We have a little blog post here that we wrote back in August. And there is a video example story and a case, a short case study here. I'm just going to highlight some things from that case study. So we have a team, and this was part of the Scrum Inc. Uh, webinar where it's Scrum and Construction la last year. It's on their Scrum Inc.'s YouTube channel. You can watch that. And there's some examples from my friends in Ireland as well, as well as in South America uh, with the an oil and gas. So there's three or four case studies just in that one hour video. We had an estimating team that was not using Scrum, seven people, 2016, they start using Scrum individually, not together as a team. After a couple of years, the work started changing and the market changed and they had to, we had more volume of work to do. And one of the people on the team said, we're not getting it done. Like I am working on Sunday regularly and this is not sustainable for me. And this is a person that's only been out of school, working and estimating for a year. So, I mean, they're young in their 20s, but they're already starting to suffer from working too many hours. Working too many hours is not good for anybody. Hello. Let's work an appropriate level of hours. So they said, let's try this as a team. So when they were working this way, they were only able to estimate one to two, sometimes three projects at any given time. They flipped over to using Scrum as a team when I say they flipped over to Scrum, they were doing sprint planning. They were doing later backlog refinement, not right away in the beginning, but later. Daily Scrum, daily stand-up meeting, five days a week. And they're doing reviews and retrospectives. And they were on a five-day sprint cycle. What happened to this team, the same seven people. Let me come over here, get a little, there we go. They started Scrum and they tripled their output, it took them four months to triple their output. Hello. Let's get some confetti on that. You're like, how, how much more? Three times as much, Francois. <laughs> they tripled their output. They went to a consistent three projects and they were all of them reduced their work hours to 50 hours a week, Monday through Friday. So no more Saturdays and Sundays. That's two more days that's theirs. Free to do whatever they want to do on their own time. And then they said, Felipe, what else can we do? And I said, well, you can start tracking velocity. And they're like, velocity? What's that? That's not in the scrum guide. I'm like, I know, but it's there. So we, it's, it's not in the scrum guide. <laughs> a velocity is a way to assign an estimated value of time, effort, energy, and other technical things to a task. So like I was telling you before, best practices, we want to make these tasks as no bigger than a day's work of work total. So you break this down until it's like less than a day. So you can see flow, handoffs, and other things. And velocity is a, a little more complicated of a concept. I'm not going to go into in this webinar, but they started tracking velocity. And from June to July, 
they doubled their output again. Yes, Francois, they doubled their output. Now they're doing almost eight projects simultaneously. They can estimate with high quality supporting eight projects, the same team. So remember the team before one to two, let's say that it's two. Now they're doing eight. That's four times what they were doing before Scrum. Four times. It's like having four estimating teams for the price of one. Yeah. And then they kept iterating even further, Francois. And by the time that they matured out in two years, they were doing nine times what they started back in 2018, where they were. Nine times the output. I mean, it, it was a team of uh, only engineers or architects? Or? They were... Uh, some of them were trained as construction managers, and but they were working in an estimating pre-construction department mm. within the company. So that's the the skill set was construction management skill set, and working as estimators. Some of them had never been an estimator before. One of the people I want to just call out, and I will call her out by name because I have her permission. Stephanie, Stephanie was an intern that was exposed to this practice in 2018. And she worked, she joined the team when they started using Scrum here in sometime in the summer 2018. She came in right before they started doing velocity tracking and she went back to school. She said she actually did a presentation about using Scrum at the end of the, her internship to the other interns to show them what it was. And she said, I, I went back to school, Felipe, and I used Scrum in my classroom. And I said, so did I, Stephanie. I used it when I got my, my master's of business administration. So I was like, birds of a feather flock together. I was like, good job. Money in your pocket, got through school. She gets out of school, gets multiple job offers, and she picks to come back to work with us, specifically this team. She even got an offer from the same company at a different location. And she said, no, I will take less money and work with this team because they use Scrum. And I'm so proud of her today. She is now the scrum master. She has, has, has gone from intern to scrum master in less than two years. I mean, it's just blows my mind. I'm like, what? In less than two years. I mean, she was just out of school two years ago. Now she's leading a team, a new team, a whole new team in the scrum framework. <laughs> it's just incredible so to yeah, see that very, type of engagement. Great opportunities. Yeah, when I've you, got a, when you want awesome. to change things. Exactly. Exactly. And it's like, and it's so funny too to to hear like you know some of the things that this team is. I consider them to be very mature, and they are doing things with planning poker and velocity that some teams never get to in Scrum. It's very cool. We have another question, Francois. What do you got? Uh yeah. We, uh, yes, we have another question from Dave. Uh, was Dave. Do you have any story to share about Scrum use to support the LPS weekly work plan? I do, Dave. I, I absolutely do. And I'm going to have to say, Dave, you're going to have to go to my YouTube channel and watch my, my live stream from two weeks ago where we talk about exactly breaking down a weekly work plan with Last Planner and converting it to Scrum. So you can see me doing it live in Mural. I mean, it's recorded now. And if you have any questions beyond that, Dave, just make a comment on that video in YouTube and I will answer your questions uh, in the comments or we can always jump on a, on a call and talk more about it. But absolutely. We, is, we, all, we already share your, your, the link to your channel. Uh, awesome. Thank you so much, Francois. You know, Francois, you're going to get the confetti for that, for sharing the link to my YouTube channel. <laughs> Thanks. That's good. Any yeah. other questions? Uh, yes, one last question. Great. Uh, how individual task I assign to each Scrum team member in terms of the contribution that each one have to do to meet the goal of the task? Whoa, whoa, whoa. Okay. So each task does not have a goal. That is, that's a great question. The the sprint itself. So let me let's a picture is worth a thousand words. Here's the team goal. Okay. Let's bring it down to the framework. So here are the Scrum goal. The scrum goal is identified during sprint planning, which happens here. This is sprint planning happening here. At that time where we sprint plan, 
the team sets the goals, typically heavily handed it by the product owner. The product owner says like, in order to achieve this project, we can have a big goal. We want to build a healthy place in our world. Now the team and their product owner, as they get more experience with Scrum, they're going to realize the benefit of making a goal. They should have a goal specific to every single sprint time box. So if we stay with Francois's example of having that federated coordinated BIM update, that if that cycle happens every five days, what is the goal of that five day cycle? So in a BIM plan, we might say the goal for this team, if we're doing a, let's say we're, we're making a, a new hospital that's three stories tall. We might say the goal for this week team is to create all of the main runs of the major equipment to be in and coordinated through the basement and level one. That could be a goal that the team sets with the product owner. Now, now that I've set that goal coordinated through level one, now we have the goal for the week. So we come back up to the tasks and we work with the team that is to make sure that each one of the tasks that we bring in, let me get rid of the stuff. Let's get this stuff out of our way. Sorry, Jeff, you gotta, you gotta go for now. So now we've, we've got the goal for the week having the major systems in i didn't even say clash free i just said get them in the model because we're early on all my cards that i pull in from backlog to sprint backlog or the to-do list should meet that goal if this card let's say for example this estimating card if something you know, let's pretend it's this card if this card doesn't meet that goal it does not cross this line you're like ah no no go back go back it has to meet the goal or it cannot be in this workflow. And if if somebody says like, well, this is super important, I'm like, yeah, it is. I don't disagree. 100%. It's important. But if it doesn't meet the goal of having all the main systems in, in the basement and level one, because we've established that that's going to get us the progress to getting this building built to create a healthy, happy building for the client, then this is not the time. Maybe in a cycle from now, and you have to negotiate with the team. The team decides from this backlog what to go in. So let's say that it meets the goal, that Asita, it meets the goal. Now that the team doing the work, and this example that you have here, uh, this would be a VDC, a BIM team, the team decides what's most important. So maybe the team says that we're going to order the work this way. And then with maybe the, the product or has some comment and feedback and they decide, well, really, it should be like this. So they'll, they'll do it and they'll sort it. And at the daily scrum, every day to the the team re-looks at what's in to do and make sure that we have things prioritized to meet that goal for the cycle. So the team self-assigns from here. Here in Backlog, the product owner can put whatever they want here, knowing that the team's going to eventually pull this in and do it. And more mature teams will use the team during the week for some time to update these things to get them ready so that by the time they get here, it's clear as day how these things will serve the goal as we get there. But if you're if you're just starting out and that's too fine, too like nuanced, too specific, don't worry about it. Just expose some of the work, practice with having that negotiation of what should go in to serve the goal and not. And you'll keep iterating your way there, cycle after cycle. You will get to the point where the team has those conversations faster and faster and the cards get made better and better to serve those goals. But someone else should not be making the cards for the team and the team decides what the order is and the team decides when something's done and the team decides when to pull the next thing in. And maybe because we're a team, we can have you know multiple people in play. Maybe this is one expertise and this is another and if this is like a six person team, there's no reason why we can't have more things in doing as long as this is not lined up with the same people, that these are different people working on these things simultaneously. That's totally okay. That's called parallel work. Hope that, if that didn't answer your question, just throw me a frowny face in the chat and then we'll we'll blame Francois for not asking better. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding, Francois. Your question asking is perfect. French accent. I love that French uh, accent. Uh, yes, we have some other question. Uh, Jamie, you ask how often has the product owner and the scrum master the same person? 
I think you you can't know. Oh, anyway. that's a good. That is a super good question, Jamie. Jamie D, let's celebrate. <laughs> Jamie D, when you if you're the only person that knows about Scrum, congratulations, Jamie D. You are going to be the product owner and the Scrum master. <laughs> <laughs> when I first started doing this, I had to be both and I had to be on the team as well. And it wasn't until a year later that I finally had other people on my scrum team besides me. But even during that time, Jamie, everybody that worked with me unknowingly surprise was on the scrum team. And when they found out later, they were like, Oh my God, we've been doing scrum this whole time with Felipe. Yes, you have. That's correct. So don't worry about it. You'll be, to start with, you might have to double duty. Now, as you mature, you might find that you have a better skill set to be in one or the other. You'll naturally gravitate in one direction. Just go with it. And then be developing somebody else on your team to take that other role. It is really powerful to have a team doing something. Right? I can do a lot of stuff by myself. But I am way more effective when I have other people helping me, especially with other talents. So that's a great question, Jamie. You get uh, extra confetti for that and a single heart. There it is. <laughs> uh, another question from Moro Pavel. Well, the anal analytical with plenty of thinking involved. Oh, yeah, the analytical. It's almost like Moro was cheating and looked at my board. So let me pull this Q&A down here. I'm going to pull this up. So there's absolutely some analytical. So like I said, I'm going to I'm going to drop this. I'll drop a link to this in the chat. That'll open this up yeah. and you'll see some resources here. But one of the things I'm going to show my personal board, some analytics. So here I've got before on the left, after on the right. Let's zoom in to just the before. So when I first started using Scrum, uh, using Trello, and uh, Bricks is built on a similar type of logic and thinking. There are definitely get some analytics here. You can see I've got average lead time. And these are, I think these numbers are from 2018. It's showing average lead time. So when the task came into my workflow, on average, it took me about 25 days before I would start working on it. They're like, wow, that car got old and stale. And then with time, you can see like reaction time, 24 days later, cycle time. You know, how often am I turning things over, lead time, and so on? That's before. When I look back at what was causing this, as a scrum master, you have to, we own how the team works and getting it better. And I am no exception. And as old as I am, I still can learn new things. I went back to the framework. Let me go back to the framework and show you. I'm knowing that I had a 25 day cycle, which means that as tasks came into my backlog here, a task would come into my backlog. It wasn't coming out of this arrow until 25 days later. So I just asked myself, like, where am I going wrong? Why am I so slow? And I looked through the whole thing. I reread the scrum guide again, probably like the 30th time. And I found out that I was shortchanging sprint planning. I was not spending enough time on sprint planning when I looked at this. And what I did was I increased my sprint planning time from at the time, a terrible 15 minutes for a five-day cycle to two to three hours. Now, here's the after. I went from a 25-day lead time to a four-and-a-half-day lead time. What is that, five times faster? Yes. That's five times it's faster. Increasing. Yeah, thank you, Francois. Increasing the cycle time or increasing the planning, more planning, I got faster. My throughput increased exponentially. I mean, that's worth at least a single heart for me. So those are some of the analytics you can get. And in Scrum, there are other things, like if you're tracking velocity, and even if your team isn't, Scrum Masters can learn. There are techniques and proxies to track throughput of your team. And you can look at things like burn down charts, burn up charts, reaction time, lead time, cycle time. There are more, there are more analytics that you can get into. But I would say Scrum Masters, industrial engineers, I'm talking to you, Industrial engineers in the audience, pay attention. Don't over measure things. If it serves the team, do it. If it doesn't serve the team, don't do it. Back away. So only do things to help serve the team. 
because you don't, there are no prizes. I didn't get a prize when I went from 25 to four. I mean, I did get a pay raise, but that's just, that's just another topic. <laughs> but you got to do things that serve the team. So be mindful of the things you're going to track. And then these metrics are for the team only. So even if you're tracking velocity, you're doing things like burn down charts and burn up charts, you keep those for the team themselves. It's not for all of the whole world to see. And I'll say that the, the metrics from one team to the next are not comparable. You can see trends, how teams are trending over time, but you cannot compare one team to another because I sold you in the beginning. Respect for people means honoring the person, the human being that's there, their unique creative talents. And you definitely can work to help teams trend towards improvement and more learning, but you do not compare team A, team B, team C, and make them compete against each other. That is inappropriate and disrespectful, not condoned in the scrum guide, not even at the scrum and scale guide. So there you go. Food for thought. So you have, you have to, we have to read the scrum guide every morning now. Uh, maybe not that much. I, I read it now probably. And there's, uh, there's people on YouTube, Francois, that read it. Uh, I know there are English versions. People read it out loud, so you can have it read to you. <laughs> I probably read it, uh, you know, maybe once a month, probably about where I'm at. Great. At least every other month. <laughs> so that's the, uh, yeah, we covered the construction story. We did the q and and In the last couple, in the last three minutes, Francois, I want to give people the online resources. So I'm going to put this. Yeah, yeah, share it in the comment if you want. Yeah, I can, I can put it in the private chat, Francois, or I'll, I'll put it in. I'll bring up the YouTube after. So when we hang up, I'll share this. So the big thank you again to the host. There's this Trello link, so you can see that there are more things here in Trello. My contact information is there. Uh, you can get all of my contact information is at the EBFC Show website, so you can find it right there. And uh, definitely, I'd love to hear if you've listened to the show, give us a review. i uh, love to hear. And we're doing a free giveaway celebrating our birthday of being one year old. You can win us, U.S. residents only, uh, free Apple AirPods giveaway. You can see we've got 33 people already registered to, to win. 35 days left. Plenty of time left if you're in the United States to get in there and uh, get your chance to win. And again, you can contact me if you want to learn more about advanced topics. I am a scrum trainer by night. <laughs> you could contact me for, for stuff there as well. I could put you in touch uh, in your country with a scrum trainer local to you if you want more advanced resources. And uh, if you want to see how to launch your pilot, there's a couple uh, short examples of how to get started right away today on your job. So I'll drop that in when we hang up, Francois. I'll make sure that gets in there. And then the, uh, the other thing I'll put in the, the chat is this LinkedIn group that uh, Francois and Sebastian are part of. This is Scrum in the Design Community. We have 76 members right now, and we're going to grow that even more. We can ask and answer questions here. We even advertise this meetup in here. There's that live stream that I was talking about here, that video link. So you can see how to connect uh, Scrum and Last Planner systems in this video. So check that out. It's a good place to, you can ask anything, and people, there are all kinds of people in here to help you with good information. And I'm one of the owners of the group. Yeah, we will share all this link uh, in the description of the video. Uh, so you can uh, watch again this uh, live uh, after, and uh, we you've got all the link uh, in the description. That's right. And people, the questions don't stop just because the live stream stops. Connect with me on social media, and uh, let's continue the conversation. And I'm serious. I'd love to see people scrum boards. I've got on yeah. online the final 60 seconds everyone sends me scrum boards from all over the world so a great collection them for me and and we'll get them out there yeah okay and there is a more and more uh, uh discussion and uh and content about uh scrum and agile in uh in construction and beam so it's a very uh, very interesting period for that <laughs> and we'll hope uh shortly we can uh meet again uh uh, in front of a whiteboard with uh, some post-it. That's very a uh, very interesting part of the uh, agile process. 
thank you very much, Felipe. So now it's a two hour of a discussion. So it was a very, very strong discussion with a lot of uh, information, but it was a uh, very, very interesting. And uh, I think we can have uh, another meetup in a, <laughs> in a few time to uh, to uh, to go more in some uh, of uh, of subject to you. You you talk to us. So uh, see you for the next meetup in a, in a one month. We will go at the beginning of July in Italy. Uh, yes, to to meet some uh, other uh, uh, scrum master in the construction industry. So thank you, Felipe. Thank you, uh, Sebastian. And uh, see you soon in uh, in some uh, social media, other social media. Thank you, everyone. Absolutely. Thank you, everybody. You don't have a sound to end the meetup? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for participating with Felipe today. It has been my pleasure and my honor to answer your questions. Thank you. Let's get out there and go build something. <laughs> thank you, Felipe. <laughs> You're welcome.